So if you were able to get the um, background color to work via the element inspector and such, you should hopefully have a new uh, background color there. Uh, I want to then look at changing some of our fonts because we've got these default basic fonts. If you look at your CSS uh, line 7, font family, we've got the Roboto regular font. If you're on an Android device, going down the cascade then uh, to Windows font or a Mac font, etc. If all else fails, the very last one is a sans serif, just a basic, plain, Arial type of font. Um, so this works cross-platform because we are referencing the default font for a variety of platforms. The most recent version of Android has the font Roboto Regular. An older version of Android operating system would have Droid Sans. If I'm trying to go with a Windows platform, there's the Windows fonts. If I'm going with a Mac platform, there are the, the Mac fonts. And then if none of those are available, then the most basic ones, Helvetica, Arial, Geneva, and then the most basic one of all, if none of those are available on the platform, sans serif. Dealer's choice. Let the device choose a most basic sans serif font, an Arial type of font. Okay, what we want is a completely different font than that. In the old days of web design, we were limited a lot in that I wanted to use a very cool font. For example, I want to add the font called Chiller. And so I would run that. Someone would then go to it, go to that website on Windows, and it would look fine. The Chiller font is a default font on Windows. But then someone visits on their Mac, and they don't have Chiller on their Mac, so then it ignores it. Or they visit it in whatever operating system that doesn't have chiller and it ignores it. So our problem here to choose a different kind of font is we can't simply mention it like this because we cannot assume that the device has the font that we want. Along came some powerful bit of CSS which will allow us to choose any font regardless if the user has it or not because in a sense we're going to embed the font within our project and therefore any device will be able to use whatever font we want. We need to do a little bit of reading up about how this works then we'll apply it to our project. But in theory we will be able to use any font we want. I'll guide us for various reasons in a moment but here's what we can do. If you just go do a search online any search engine and go search for at font dash face this is the CSS selector. This is the CSS rule that will allow us to choose any font. And when previously we've talked about, for example, border radius or box shadow, those were CSS3 specific CSS rules. That means that box shadow doesn't work on an older version of a web browser. And font face a lot of people think about it in terms of it being a CSS3 rule, but actually it's a CSS2 rule. It's just that no one really adopted it and used it. This specification has been has been out there a while. No one quite used it, and now that we're in the world of like CSS3 and such, um, it uh, is a little bit more universal. So you can go read up about what it is and all of that in a variety of spots. I haven't looked at it myself, but at fontface.com seems pretty cool. And then there's, of course, over at the W3 schools, how does it work? I'm going to take a quick look there just to see their example of what the code looks like. It's going to be CSS code written in a very specific way. And notice the example is we would write the at fontface. This is one of the very few things that has an at. Uh, where you've got either the dot for class, the pound for ID, and we've got some other ones, and then we've got at, at font face. Basically we're saying font family, my first font, and its source. We're seeing the source of the font via, via URL and then, and then the font in a particular format. This should allow then that the particular 
font that we specify will work. But notice there's a variety of caveats. Which particular font are you using in TTF format, in SVG, etc.? It's compatible in these versions of Chrome. Notice if you're going to use WAF, for example, it has to be this version. It's not supported in, in, in Edge. It's not supported in Safari, and so forth. So they're still sort of like rough around the edges about how this works, but I'll show us the trick to really make it work properly. The point here is, okay, if I write this code and I also embed the, uh, the font file in my project, in theory this will work. TTF, if I have my font in the TTF format, it should work basically on all browsers, and mobile browsers as well. If I'm trying to use something like SVG, which might be higher quality, notice it's not visible on some devices. So we have a website that will allow us to kind of save some effort um, by it generating the code for us and giving us the font properly set up. So let's go to this website here, fontsquirrel.com. Fontsquirrel.com. The thing about fonts is that it's similar to images. If you're a web designer, hopefully you got a lecture at some point about not stealing images to make websites. If you didn't get that lecture, let me give you that lecture right now. Don't steal images to make your websites. What that means is don't simply go to Google and Bing or Yahoo, whatever, and type and search for cats and put it up on your cat website. Don't go out and looking for a picture of computer motherboard to borrow it and put it on your website. Don't do that. Don't go off and do any sort of image search to find the perfect image to put on your site or app. Because most likely that image is copyrighted. Most likely someone created that image, usually for commercial purposes, and you're stealing it. There's no other way to say it, really. You're stealing that image. If you didn't create the image, you don't know where it came from. Unless you know exactly where it came from, you have to assume you're stealing it. Even though it's super easy to go to any search engine and find a million images, do not use those images. Unless you search specifically for royalty-free images, or stock images, public domain images, Creative Commons images, unless you specifically know that that image is okay for you to use. In this class, we are not going to use a lot of those, those external images and such. What we do want to do, though, is talk about fonts. And fonts fall under the same camp. I can go to a variety of websites where I can find a thousand and one free fonts. But that doesn't really mean those fonts are okay for you to use. It's very easy for some webmaster to create a website and put a bunch of fonts there that they got through some means and then have you download them and then now you're in trouble because you're using someone's font. And just like images, some images I have to pay for to be able to use on my site and an image could be five dollars per usage, could be fifty dollars per usage, hundred dollars, I don't know. There's a variety of prices for images and fonts as well. You can buy fonts for a variety of prices. I've seen fonts that cost two thousand dollars. Yes, one font that costs more than your computer itself. So, to avoid all of that with images and fonts, you want to go to places where fonts are available royalty-free, or as public domain, or as stock. And fontsquirrel.com is one of those places. Do you see at the top left, it says 101 or 100% free commercial use fonts? What does it say? 101, yeah, 100% free for commercial use. So you can go do a Google search and find the perfect font. <coughs> do you need to purchase the license for it? Most likely, yes. Do you need, are you able to use that font that you purchased for commercial purposes? Maybe not. It depends on the contract or the terms of service that you've agreed to when you downloaded that font. Why risk any of that? Why not go directly to websites that focus on safe content like Font Squirrel. You're not going to find a million results here like over 
over at like Google Fonts or whatever. But here, oops. But here, um, these are going to be safe images. I mean, safe fonts. So there's these different fonts. Notice these styles. They're all downloadable and such. If you kind of browse around, maybe this Alex Brush font would be perfect for my um, would be perfect for my design. But um, just browse around for a moment. You'll see that. Um, We'll see that you have a variety of options. The way we'll use this is you can browse, you can see all of these fonts, and then we'll, we'll talk about how do we add it to our project. Uh, what we need to keep in mind first is that If you see below a particular font, you're going to see icons. We have commercial desktop use. Free license allows you to create commercial graphics and documents. Font face embedding. This free licensing allows you to embed the font on your website with CSS. Ebooks and PDFs. This free license allows you to embed the font in ebooks and portable documents. And this free license allows you to embed the fonts in applications and software. Some don't have all of them, like right here, Carrara. This one is not technically set up for you to use in your app. This free license does not allow you to embed the font in your app. So you still have to pay attention here. You do have all of these fonts to work with, but you still have to keep a little eye out for the icon right there. I can use Coiny, and uh, what else I can use? Kelvinch, Peace Sands, Uni, Unifrofter, what is that? Unifrofter, um, Soria. So you have a variety of fonts that you can use. Here's what we'll do. Um, browse font scroll for a moment. Find a font that is okay for you to use, which probably is all four of those are turned on. Once you find the font, if you'd like, you can get one or two. Make sure then you click, you go through it to to the download link. Download those files. We'll see then how to use them in a moment. Now, before you pick a font, again, um, there's a discussion that could be had about uh, graphic design and so forth regarding what are the best combinations of fonts. Because some font that looks really nice, like Riffic, might not look very good as body text. We have various things that we're going to keep in mind here. We are going to have text. It is display text and text that is body text. And what that means is display text would be text that's large, like welcome or my SDCE. Body text will be small text, like in here. Regular readable text. You know, headings and headers should have a certain font characteristic font face, and then basic text. We haven't really added a lot of basic text <coughs> to our project yet, but the example would be over inside of these boxes. You don't want a crazy, interesting font for text that people are going to read, uh, like here in the calendar. This is a perfect example. There's going to be blocks of text that are that is going to be okay for us to make a nice, cool, weird, crazy font because it's a little bit of text to read. But I don't want those crazy fonts for something where the text is longer, where there's more regular text to read. Then that gets annoying to read. 
and you don't want to annoy your 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 the people that download your project because then they'll go over to the app store and give you one star and complain about your terrible fonts. So when you're thinking about what you're going to download here, think about mostly about which interesting font you're going to use for headings, for headers, that sort of thing. If any of these say something like download off-site, I would skip it. That's kind of a little more hassle. You have to go to some other site. If it has directly download OTF, that should be better. It should allow you to download the font directly from the website. You can uh, click on a particular font and then look at it in a variety of sizes. Look at that. That looks nice as big text. But then when it's small text, it's getting a little harder to read. So you can click on any font name to see in detail. And then better yet, you can go over to the top here where it says Test Drive. You can type in some text. And see what it looks like different sizes. At 12 point it might be a lot smaller than you think. So download one or two of them. depending on the font. So I downloaded two here. One is Surya and one is Bungie. Depending on the font, if you look inside the zip file, it'll just be one copy of the font. Or depending on the zip file, like Bungie, here's the hairline version, the inline version, the regular version, the shaded outlined, etc. The layers version. It's up to you to decide which one you want to use. Okay, so in general, what the process for this is, we might not write it in the notepad. Let me make some notes here. Remember our notes. Steps for adding at font phase. Go to fontscroll.com, find a good font that looks good as a heading or body text. Download either the OTF or the TTF version of the file extract. Then what we need to do is we will need to return, to, we will return to font scroll. Dot com, and we then use the font face generator, the font kit generator. Let's see what they call it the, right here, the generator. So we'll say uh, return to uh, font scroll.com, go to the generator, upload the file, so the TTF or the OTF. Download the kit, unzip it, add the CSS that was generated, and supporting files 
to your project. We'll do this together in just a moment, of course. It's a couple of steps, but when we do it once or twice, it'll, it'll, it'll make a lot of sense. And the whole point of this is to give you unique, interesting, custom fonts. We have the most basic Arial fonts. I want to add something interesting, like Bungie font. So we need to do all of this. I did, I went to the font scroll, I downloaded it, I unzipped it. So next I need to do the, the generator portion. For some reason, font scroll keeps crashing on me. What about you guys? Maybe we're all crashing it. But hopefully then, um, I downloaded it, then I'm going to go back up to here, Generator. I will, up, I will select to upload a font. I'm going to choose, the, in my particular case, the regular version of the font. So I'll select that and upload it. It read it, and then you can have various options. Just the optimal option is fine. And then here's why we need to go through this whole setup. Yes, the fonts I'm uploading are legally eligible for web embedding. You can go to any website in the world, find a cool font, and try to do this. And then it'll ask you this. And then, of course, it's up to you to be honest about it or not. But if you're not, and you're using some commercial font you shouldn't be using for this purpose, in theory, then you get caught. With, you get caught. Worst case or best case scenario, you get a letter that says, please stop using our font. Worst case scenario, you get a letter that says, please stop using our font. And here's the bill for you using our font. And worstest case scenario is they ask you to stop using it, they fine you, and then here comes the lawyer for further damages. So why not use fonts that are safe for you to do this, to avoid any possibility? Yes, you're going to be a needle in a haystack out of the millions of apps at the App Store. But maybe, just in case, you get caught. So here's how you avoid it. Use something like Font Squirrel, 100% free fonts. Now when you're answering that, you're being honest. Click download your kit. This will process it, give us a bunch of files. We're going to use those files in just a moment. Question? Did you choose the regular font? In my particular one, yeah, I chose the regular version. It's, it's, it's like the most basic version of my font. It'll probably look the best. You know, mine has an example like hairline, which looks really weird and interesting, but it might be hard to read. So eventually, it processes it. It downloads it right here. Web font kit with some sort of identifier that you probably want to save in your flash drive for easy access later. I'm just taking a moment to save that font kit in my folder. I also want to extract it. Once you get that web font kit zip file, select to extract it. So what comes from that zip file, it might depend on a variety of things, but what I get, sometimes it, it varies, that is, depending on what you've uploaded. 
what I get then is an HTML file that demonstrates what you have. Then you get the font, the optimized web fonts themselves, maybe some config file in a, in a style sheet, specimen files that's just related to the demo here. But if I open the demo file as a plain old website, it'll open it up and then it'll show me here's my font, here's how it looks in a variety of sizes, it's demo, here's how it looks as your body, and size 24 on black on white, etc. Here's the list of characters, and then how to use it, we'll do that in a moment. Um, And then if we peek inside of that CSS file in Notepad to see what it gave us there, here's how it basically works. At font face, font family, bungee regular, regular in my case. Source, URL, bungee regular web font dot WAF2, format WAF2, comma, URL, bungee regular web font dot WAF, format WAF semicolon. Depending on your font, this may go on a couple more lines because this is how you create this this universal way that it works. Like we saw Roboto, comma, Droid, comma, Segoe, comma, Helvetica. There's all of those in a sequence. If Roboto is not working, go to the second choice, Segoe. If Segoe is not working, go to the next choice, Ariel. If that's not working, go to the next choice. That's what this is saying. Let's try to use the bungee font. And here's where bungee font is, format WAF2. Well, if your device doesn't understand it, comma, try the next version, WAF. Well, depending how yours is, it may further go comma, TTF, comma, OTF, comma, whatever. Depends on what you got processed. Resetting the font weight and font style to normal. So this basically activates the ability for our project to use that font. The way we will use it is then if you're looking at the uncompressed if you're looking at the uncompressed um, zip file you need to do a couple of things. You need to copy the font files into your into your project. So I've got my project folder on the right, WW folder. I'm going to copy the the font files. I can do some organization and put them in subfolders and all that if I want. But I'm copying the font files that FontSquirrel gave me in the zip file. And then from the CSS file, the style sheet CSS sample file, you want to open that in Notepad. You want to copy that block of code there. Don't forget the closing curly brace. You want to copy that, whatever yours is. Mine goes from 5 to 12. Yours may be more or less. You want to copy that. That activates the font because it's referencing its URL, its source. It's referencing it right there. That's why we copy those WAS files or whatever yours was. TTF, OTF, and SVG, whatever. You copy them all into your project because your CSS is referencing them. And then in our codica.ext file, I would recommend to put it as the very first thing at the top because we're saying give us the ability to use this font right away. Remember the cascade. Give us the ability to use this font right away. In my case, it's going to be bungee underscore regular, regular, in quotes, either single or double quotes. But wherever now I use font family, this will apply. I think just to kind of test it out, h2 font uh, font family 
equal and in my case spongy regular. So the first line I'm activating the usage of the font and then here I'm actually using it. I'm applying bungee regular to heading twos. In theory, all my heading twos throughout my project <coughs> should get this should should activate this font. Mm -hmm. Well, this one is just going to allow us to use the font. It doesn't apply it yet. Here, then, it applies Roboto font everywhere. But then, here, we say only H2 uses Bungie. I think we can just simply save all of this and again just quickly do a run from Notepad into Chrome. Shouldn't need anything special. Look at that. So I'm seeing heading two. Welcome. I'm seeing it over on the art screen, computer screen. That's basically copied and pasted from the example CSS file. And then actually using it there. Heading two. It's applying to the to the headings throughout my project. Maybe it would be a little bit more impressive if I was seeing it up here on the um, on the heading of the app. Well, I need to figure out what CSS code specifically works for that. That's when it comes back to using the inspect elements. Doing a little bit of experimenting here. Like I said, uh, using that element inspector and then activating the selector. I clicked up on top here. The inspector is telling me UI header, UI title. I added the new font family. That one was not there. I clicked to add a brand new font family and then pasted in the name of my font. It seems to have taken it up there. I have to write it permanently over on my Kodika file, of course. But the point of this is I'm trying to figure out what's the proper code. This uh, seems to be correct, even though perhaps we still also need the H1 part of it. We'll see fully in just a moment. But from what I'm seeing, in this case it's got UI header, UI title, comma, UI footer dot UI title. So only the header title is bold. That's why only, in theory, the top should change. The bottom also changed, though, because this CSS selector ha has been defined. Then comma, the second one, footer and title. But when we put commas, we're saying apply the following style to this CSS selector, comma, and this CSS selector, comma, and this CSS selector. Simply writing H2 applied to all the H2s throughout my project. And remember, H1 and H4 are at my header and my footer. I suppose we could try to write something like H1, comma, H4, and then the following. Font family. Uh, but we'll try it this way first. 
that's something that I got out of the inspector. And notice how, how it's written here. Uh, UI uh, dot UI dash header space. That is very important not to have a space there, or to have a space there actually. Space dot and then title comma space UI footer space UI title. So the title element is inside of the header element comma. <coughs> title element inside of the footer element. Those are classes, so they'll apply throughout my whole project. The comma in the middle means apply what I'm going to put in the curly braces upon both of those. If I had something else, let's say like UI-content or something, um, notice I would have another comma there to say apply what follows in the parentheses to these three CSS selectors. That's what the comma means. So I'm using the same font family, bungee, regular, regular, hopefully then to apply it to my headers and footers. Question. It might make better sense right here. Right now, I'm only applying the, the bungee regular to anything that's in H2. But if I say, well, I wanted to apply to a heading 1 and a heading 2 and a heading 4, that's what the comma is, to specify what selectors I'm applying the following properties to. It just so happens that that's a complex property up there based on um, the element inspector. The element inspector tells me that it's UI, it's dot UI header, dot UI title. That's one thing. That would have only, if we only had that, it would only apply the font to the header. We would leave the footer alone because we never specified footer. So with the comma, we're saying, okay, now also apply this to the footer. Exactly. I think with my particular font, the the header up on top looks a little puny, so then I went in and added a little bit of code to make it a little larger. That's simply adding right here, because now I'm targeting the title, the titles, I can make them 125. Well, in this case, perhaps, I don't want 125 for both. If I put 125% for header and footer, both of them will be as that big. Maybe I don't want the footer to be that big. So in that case, I would separate out Separate it out like this. I have one rule that defines what does the header look like, its font size. And here I'm not specifying a font size, so it will stay to the original size, but I have to then separate it to footer on its own. So here it is when I have both at 125% header and footer. And then here it is when I separate them to individual ones, 125%, whatever default that was. Whatever, there's no wrong answer here. I might like both to be that size. You might like that. Fine. You might want them to be different, like this. So you saw the two rules, the two ways to handle that. Because I'm going to put this into my network folder, I will leave, I will, I will put it like this, um, commented. I'll 
let's say, um, applies to both header, footer, this equally. This one. Applies differently to header and footer. If you do use that, hopefully remember to remove that uh, comment there, or it'll get confused. If I then um, back up over here, we know it's our custom code. I'll just make a note here. Uh, activates the use of a custom font from fontscroll.com. I've been testing it in my browser, but what I want to do, of course, at a certain point, is uh, run it on a real device. We'll see how that goes. Um, possibilities during this workflow is that because my device went to sleep, perhaps my computer forgot that it's connected. So we'll see what happens. Most likely, the way to fix that is I simply unplug and replug the device. But I did w wake it up here. Let's see if it found it. As you look at this over and over, it, there'll be a certain point where you'll probably see the name of your device zoom by. If you don't see it, then that means it didn't recognize your device. And it kind of zoomed by, so I didn't see it. But I'll assume it's going to run properly on my device. Looks good. So I've got my font on the top and bottom, and the main welcome. We'll do one more thing, then we'll take a break. I noticed on my case. Yeah, I noticed that on my device. Computer glasses gets cut off, and in this case, it also gets cut off. Uh, this is something that I need to play with, with some good size fonts and such. But another thing that I could do is that the, um, the, top, um, the top has a bit of a padding that's bigger than it might need to be. If I inspect that part up there, I will see within my code here, margin, padding of the header and footer. There's a margin and a padding. Margin 0 and 30%. When we have two values, remember, we have the box model with four sides of a box what's happening with only two values. Anyone remember that? Um, Just top and bottom and left and right. Top and bottom, um, left and right. Top and bottom, left and right. So that's why 30% there, it's a margin, 30%, and therefore it's cutting off there. If I click that and decrease that value, 20%? 
I don't have so much dead space up there. Now, here I could decide to have a short amount of text at the top and never change that code. But if I'm going to have a larger amount of text up here, then I might need to change that margin. What I got right under the inspector is this header, title, footer, title. And it was margin, uh, started off as 0, 30%. So obviously, here this would apply to both the header and the footer. I might not want that. I think the, the footer, um, I think the footer uh, was, was already pretty good. So I'm, what I might need to do here is simply target the the title and it looked like 20 percent looked nice that's the top of there as for the footer text being a little large well that was because over here I had kind of forced both the header and the footer at 125 percent. Okay, so look at how far in our time so far we've come. Uh, we started off with that plain old project we've been dealing with for all of these weeks. And now we're getting to something more visually interesting. We changed the colors via CSS. We've changed the, the fonts. Uh, we're going to take a break and when we come back, then we're going to deal with, well, what about changing, um, uh, changing some of these icons? We have all of these 50 built-in ones. What if I want to use my own unique icon? So we'll take a break, and I'll show you what we need to do for that. It's 8.35. We'll take a break until 8.45, and we'll go on.